You don't want your kids to know terror. Keep them away from me. Some guy who doesn't want to get rid. Folks, please, be quiet. Close your doors. Get back inside. Be quiet and close the door. creepy and pretty melodramatic clip, but it brings up some important issues and particularly important technology. So we had in that clip a couple of things. We had thermal imaging, we had sort of smart security robotics, and we had biometrics. Um, and I'm sure that most of the folks, many of the folks in this audience know more about what's really possible than I do, and I was hoping to learn a bit more in that sensor talk, but I couldn't even get in. It was so crazy today. Um, but is there anyone working in this area that sort of sees a lot of this almost on the horizon? Is there anyone in there? All right. Well, and on the legal side, one of the things that we really want to talk about is for those who were here earlier for the EFF talk about laptop searches, got a little bit of a primer on the Fourth Amendment. But when we're talking about searches, when we're talking about thermal imaging, it's talking about the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Any calls? They turned off their cell phones. Okay. If you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the government needs a warrant to search or seize. So we had in there, we had bots going into an apartment building, scanning everyone's eyes. So the question is, is this actually legal? Does it violate the Fourth Amendment? Um, and to answer that, we actually have to turn to some dog cases. So true, we've got a bunch of dog sniffing cases um, out there. And a lot of them have a lot to do with the issue about whether or not this is legal. So in 2005, there was a Supreme Court case called Illinois versus Cabalas, which is a routine traffic stop. Um, there was another cop in the area who happened to have a dog sniffing, a drug sniffing dog with him. So he stopped by, the dog sniffs this guy's car, alerts that there's some drugs, and the cops get into the trunk. The court says that it's actually um, that this warrantless dog sniff was not unconstitutional because they said it was not intrusive. The dog wasn't all up in there with this guy's stuff in the trunk. You know, he was just going around the side. And that it was actually limited capture, that the dog sniffing this guy's trunk only captured information related to the fact that he'd been involved in wrongdoing. And the court has said that um, the expectation that certain facts won't come to the attention of authorities is not the same as an interest in privacy that society is prepared to consider reasonable. So the bottom line is your hash stash is not a privacy interest, according to the court. And so it means that, you know, if, if there's this dog sniffing along the outside, that the Fourth Amendment doesn't stop this from happening. So the police get to pass go, collect $200. They don't need a warrant. Um, this clip is obviously a lot more intrusive than a dog sniffing around the trunk of a car. We've got the bots coming into the apartment. We've got them stopping the people, making them stop, opening their eyes. Um, it's also capturing a lot more information about their identity. It's not just capturing information about whether or not there's drugs in that apartment building. It's actually capturing who they are. And really important to the fact about whether or not this kind of thing is legal is the location of where this is happening. It's not happening on a public street. It's actually happening in someone's apartment building where they live. And very much in sort of um, legal jurisprudence, the home is really our castle. And this, this clip also brought up issues related to thermal scanning. And that's actually also been um, looked at by the Supreme Court in a case called Kylo, 
um, where it was found that warrantless thermal imaging of somebody's house was unconstitutional. Um, because it also captured much more than the fact that somebody had pot in their house and was growing pot. It actually, as they said, it captured whether or not the lady of the house was engaged in bathing. So details of the home that otherwise the police wouldn't have been able to get to. So here the police obviously couldn't have figured out that hottie Tom Cruise was in the, you know, the bathtub unless they had thrown the bots in. So we've got the dog sniff cases, which say no Fourth Amendment protection. We've got the thermal imaging cases that say um, there is Fourth Amendment protection. Now what about a dog sniff or a thermal imaging of the house? And we have a case like that from 2006, which said you can't lead a dog up to somebody's house, have them sniff for pot, and have it still be, un still have it be constitutional without a warrant. So, we have sort of a, a mishmash of cases in this area, but it just goes to show you that these kinds of clips, you know, it's not quite as cut and dry. And here for the DEF CON crowd, you know, this seems like a physical surveillance clip, but this kind of um, jurisprudence about dog sniffing actually really translates a lot to things that we're doing in electronic communications, because we've got dog sniffing and we've got packet sniffing. And there's a lot of thought out there that just like a dog is not being intrusive, they're just going around the side, they're only finding information that you've done wrong, there's a lot of talk out there that if a computer, not a sentient being, um, very much similar people analogize to a dog, is actually sifting through all of the data that's traveling through in packets, that a Fourth Amendment also shouldn't be implicated. So this is a real issue that Kevin and I are having to work on, talking about the fact that there needs to be an understanding that a search occurs at the time when information is collected and sifted and not just later on. So um, this also has a real impact um, on when we're using Gmail. Um, if we're actually allowing companies to sift through our information for marketing purposes, we have a lot of worries that that's going to implicate people's reasonable expectation of privacy is when the court looks at these issues. So it looks like kind of a crazy clip, but unfortunately it's not quite as crazy as it may seem when you get down into the weeds of a lot of the court cases that we deal with every day. So yeah, so just remember the legal rule is if the robots are all up in your business, that's unconstitutional. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, what, what's portrayed in that clip is so, is so unconstitutional. Even Antonin Scalia would think it was a dead easy case. Um, on the issue of dog sniffing and the precedent that sets for surveillance methods that only detect contraband, we've seen this discussed in particular in the context of child porn. Um, I can think of in particular an article written by Richard Salgado, a former DOJ attorney, then at Yahoo, now at Google, uh, who, amongst other things, plays the judge at Hacker Court at Black Hat, uh, which we did a couple of days ago. He wrote an article arguing that it would, be, uh, it would not be a search for providers to be provided with hashes of child porn to then match against their traffic uh, to determine whether their traffic contained child porn, because the argument being child porn is unprotected speech, it's clearly illegal, and so if, if this stuff has been adjudicated to be child porn, then scanning everybody's content to see if it contains that would not be a search. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at the next clip, uh, or two clips, well, let's do one at a time, from The Departed, and this is surveillance of a, uh, an arms deal that's going on where the FBI or the law enforcement folks have an informant uh, Leo DiCaprio pretending to be one of the bad guys while the bad guys have Matt Damon pretending to be one of the good guys. It's a good movie. Oh, I think he cut it when it accidentally started. Could we get the sound back on the computer? Piece of cake. He'll operate the cameras, you ID the guys and log them. All cell phone signals are under surveillance through the courtesy of our federal friends over there. Patriot Act. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, can they do it? Y'all can do it. I mean, really, it just takes antennas uh, and some cracking ability. Uh, but uh, it's actually not legal for them to do that. Uh, the Patriot Act does not 
uh, actually uh, modified wiretapping law in, a, in relatively minor ways, particularly in the law enforcement context. It added to the types of crimes that one could wiretap for, but it certainly would not give them authority to wiretap every cell phone in the area, uh, although I do think it was, is probably within their technical capabilities. But let's go ahead and play the next clip. They turned off their cell phones. Search randomly for calls made from the area. 807 phones are live in this area. The narrow the area. What you see there for service is what you're going to get. Yeah, why the fuck did they turn their phones off? Wait, there's still one phone up. Where? The buyers are there. You know, direct contact with your guys would have its advantages. Uh, so we played that clip because of the obvious tie-in to location surveillance using your cell phone, which is definitely possible and done routinely. Uh, although, again, I certainly hope that tracking the location of every phone in an area uh, is not routine. Although we have seen instances of them getting stored data about everyone who was in a particular area at a particular time. It's called a cell dump. Uh, we saw it in... Uh, an investigation of uh, a bank robbing gang called the Scarecrow Bandits, where they got cell dumps on the cell towers near all the banks that were robbed at the time they were robbed, and then mined that data to try and find out who was at all the locations making calls at the same time. Um, the legal standard for tracking a cell phone is something that uh, we at EFF have been working on for many years. ACLU is also working on that, and we regularly file briefs fighting with the government over whether a warrant is required uh, to track your cell phone or not. Um, there have been a, about three dozen cases now, uh, most of them holding that a warrant is required, hooray, uh, but those are all lower courts. And when the government has lost, it has refused to appeal, even often when the courts encourage them to do so, because if there's a bad rule, if there's a ruling against them in a higher court, say in a circuit court, that's actually going to affect their practice. Um, these dozens of courts ruling against them hasn't affected their practice. They still seek permission to track cell phones without probable cause routinely, and it is routinely that permission is routinely granted. Uh, and so we're doing our best to fight that. Uh, both in court and uh, on Capitol Hill as part of the Digital Due Process Coalition, something I've mentioned uh, in previous panels, if you saw me on those, uh, where we in ACLU and the Center for Democracy and Technology have gotten together with companies such as Google and Microsoft and, and uh, our off-time enemies, AT&T, uh, to get Congress to update uh, electronic privacy law to do a variety of things and, in particular, require warrants for cell phone tracking. Um, and it's, it's not transparent at all. I mean, a lot of times when these orders are, are given, when these cases come through, we don't actually hear about them. So it's only the ones that we hear about that we're able to litigate. And that's why it's so important. Yes, we can go to court, but it would be far better for there to be clear rules about location information. And so Kevin mentioned earlier in one of his talks about the importance of clarifying the rules for email. Um, location information is one of the key pieces there that we also want to make sure that there's warrant protection for all types of location information. And also importantly, we want to, uh, the ACLU is pushing to have reporting requirements so that it's clear to the public and to Congress how often the government is actually demanding this kind of information. In, we have a wiretap report, but we don't have the equivalent um, kinds of reporting for a lot of other types of government demands. And, um, you know, we have to get it through FOIAs or Chris Segoyan getting people drunk to find out this kind of information. Uh, wouldn't it be better to actually have uh, reporting requirements? So we're definitely pushing for that. And also to make sure that if the government actually does violate the law, um, you know, Kevin's been saying that, you know, their practices haven't changed even though courts have, have said that it should be otherwise. And there is no suppression remedy. If the government doesn't follow the law, they can still often use this information in court. So we want to make sure that if the government does break the law, that they also can't continue to use this information. So this is something that uh, Kevin and I work on quite a lot, um, both in the courts but also in the legislature, to try and create better clarity.